Growing up religiously watching Clarkson Hammond May era Top Gear, I have retrospectively recognised a trend of flash in the pan sports cars. Some out of a shed startup would lend a car to the show for Clarkson to slide around the track, each claiming their car would be the next to take on the likes of Aston, Lamborghini, and Ferrari. Names like Koenigsegg, Pagani, Gumper, Wiesmann, Ascari, Marcos, Noble, and Veritas all probe at my memories and produce a sense of living room nostalgia. Only normally produced by playing Zelda Skyward Sword or telling my friend the ether was real. Or more accurately, being told the ether was real. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. And you're not really fine. You just Koenigsegg and Pagani of course went on to bigger and better things, but besides that you just don't hear about any of these companies anymore. Noble's new car was supposed to launch sometime in late 2022, but they've been coasting on the M600 for so long I'm not sure anyone's left to care. Bavaria-based Gumper went bankrupt, got bought by a Hong Kong-based consortium, and are now making a car they desperately want everyone to think is Italian. And Wiesmann went bankrupt and got bought by the heir to a technology solution group. I was sceptical, but they actually showed off a prototype like they said they would, so we'll see where that goes. All the others seemingly vanished into thin air, much like the money the companies were set up to launder. But of all of them, one stood out as having the most promise. With an instantly recognisable design language both inside and out, the confidence to put their money where their mouth was, and a willingness to push boundaries in what seemed like the wildest, but retrospectively clairvoyant ways. Yet somehow, despite so much promise, it has been a painfully long and drawn-out death for one of the most unique car manufacturers of the 21st century. In a story so convoluted and dense, it begins to challenge 40k law. I'm of course talking about Spiker. Because it's the title of the fucking video. Sorry, before we continue, we're gonna need something. Yeah, this is gonna be a rough ride. Despite making their current Zeitgeist debut on Episode 7 Series 4 of Top Gear, Spiker is a name with strong heritage. The 60 horsepower racer of 1903 was the most technically advanced thing on the roads in its day, with conventions that have long been the automotive standard making their debut here. It was the first road car with four-wheel drive, the first with a six-cylinder engine, and the first with four-wheel brakes. When the Ford Model T was still five years away, that's bloody impressive. Impressiver than that, a nearly stock Spiker 1418 was entered in one of the most sensational and grueling races of all time, the 1907 Peking to Paris Rally. Honestly, I could make a video just about this race. The route looks less like a rally and more like the long march of the Red Army, except it was almost twice as long. At 9,317 miles, it makes the Cannonball Run look like the hangover run to Tesco. It's like the Dakar Rally snorted all the drugs you meant to shoot up and ate the rest as pizza toppings. And it was done in cars not far removed from horse-drawn carriages with engines stuffed in as an afterthought. Of 40 entrants, only five teams showed up at the starting line in Beijing, and of those five, the two and a half litre Spiker not only finished the race, but it did so in second place, behind only a 7.4 litre Atala. This truly momentous achievement would not go on to define the rest of Spiker's history, because they went bankrupt six years later in 1913. Bought out by investors, all models were canned except the 1330C1, a modern looking car for the time, but one that didn't sell as well as hoped. Towards the end of World War I, Spiker would begin experimenting with planes. Chekhov's gun is a narrative principle. This led to pioneering automotive aerodynamic design with the C1 Aerocock. My notes say leave a gap for the audience to laugh at cock. In 1920, they launched their final car, the 1340 horsepower C4. A car that on its own showed that cracks were beginning to form as for the first time it featured a different manufacturer's engine. The 5.7 litre Maybach lump was still impressive for the time though, allowing the C4 to break the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost's endurance record by 6,000 kilometres, which had stood unbroken since 1907. Two years later, a C4 fitted with aerodynamic bodywork broke the world record for average speed, travelling at an average of 74.5 miles an hour over two 12-hour periods. All this wasn't enough though, as that same year Spiker went bankrupt again. Bought out by their British distributors, production continued until 1926 before, once again, the money ran out. Many assumed for the last time. 
Of course, that was until 1999, when in typical startup fashion, a Dutch town planner called Martin de Bruyne, I'm so sorry, decided to test his metalworking abilities by buying the rights to the Spiker brand, assembling a small team of lads, 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 and building a car in his shed. Evidently, he should always have been designing cars instead of towns, because for a backyard special, the Spiker Silvestris V8 was a very clean piece of kit. Nicking the 3.6 litre unit from an Audi V8 and tuning it to produce 265 horsepower, the Silvestris made its debut at the traditional gathering place for the bourgeois to circle jerk over the multi-million pound playthings they only use twice a year at the Goodwood Festival. There, it was spotted by entrepreneur and fellow Dutchman, Victor Muller, who agreed to co-found with Martin the new Spiker cars. Keep an eye on Victor, he's gonna be trouble. Not long after that, the Sylvestris was developed into the C8, which was made famous on that episode of Top Gear where James May explains about half the video thus far in about 10 seconds, before smash cutting to possibly the most mid-2000 soundtrack I've ever heard. The C8 ironed out most of the rough edges of the Sylvestris and became a genuinely stunning car. As far as I can tell, Martin designed both the exterior and interior himself, and while the exterior was good looking in its own right, the interior is the real showstopper here. Nothing but leather and machine turned aluminium as far as the eye can see and the hand can touch. Designed to invoke the feeling of being in a cockpit to reference Spiker's late World War I attempts to build planes, these interiors are pieces of art, with the pièce de résistance being that exquisite exposed gear linkage. The car wasn't all show, either. Sticking with an Audi heart, this time a 4.2 V8, power was up to 400 horsepower. In a chassis that weighed 1.2 tons, it was astonishingly fast for 2004. Handling was somewhat agricultural, but the car's mark had already been made. Spiker was out to prove that they were the real deal, and not just another poorly pretending Ponzi scheme preoccupied with pinching your purse. They started this in 2001 by launching a hardtop version of the Spider, dubbed the La Violette, no I don't care what that means, which somehow managed to improve on the Spider's looks to become a simply spectacular looking car. However, perhaps more importantly than that, the same year Spiker assembled a race team and developed a brand new race car, the 1212R, with the express intent of taking on Le Mans. Thus began... The Misadventures of the Spiker Squadron! This was significant, because neither Koenigsegg, Pagani, or any other young supercar manufacturers had gone into racing at that point, lending credibility to Spiker's potential compared to their peers. It didn't matter that they never did... well... except for that one time. There were pictures of Spikers wearing racing liveries on the track, building upon the provenance of the Spiker name. Spiker had built numerous successful races in the early 20th century, winning grueling endurance races before the 24 Hours of Le Mans even existed, so tapping into that heritage by returning to the track would be key in reviving the brand. 2006 would prove to be the golden age for Spiker's revival. The new company sold 94 cars that year, which may not sound like much, but is approaching viability for a small boutique manufacturer. Furthermore, Spiker would delve further into the race scene by buying the Midland F1 team, which it would rename Spiker F1 a year later. To top it all off, at that year's Geneva Motor Show, they predicted the future. 16 years before the Pura Sangue, 14 before the DBX, 12 before the Urus and Cullinan, and 10 before the Levante and Bentayga, Spiker invented the Super SUV. Okay, the KN technically got there first, but the first gen KNs were lazy and terrible, and no one likes them, and they suck! Besides that, yeah, Spiker spotted the trend a decade before every other supercar manufacturer. Love or hate SUVs, Lord knows I have some very specific opinions. You have to admit, that is some incredible foresight. It wasn't as if they tried to ride a trend before it arrived, either. The day it was unveiled, Spiker received 100 requests for orders for the D12 peaking to Paris, a very fitting name that paid homage to the legendary rally that took place 99 years earlier. While D12 was a reference to the intended power plant, the VAG W12 used by Bentley. Not long after this, Spiker even announced a super saloon, the E12, to take on the likes of the Panamera and Quattroporte. Spiker was looking like they could make a large enough impression to become a permanent member of the supercar club like Pagani and Koenigsegg now have, and perhaps even branch out into a multi-model range catering to all markets of baller dickhead. Car 
Spikers and, and bids. But spikers don't appear on all the influencers' timelines. Supercar Blondie doesn't make videos about them, and the website is outdated and hasn't been changed since 2020. What the hell happened? After 2006, production numbers dropped to roughly what they were previously. The logical conclusion would be to boost advertising, or focus on development of the D12 that had buyers chomping at the bit. No. See, Martin had left the company in 2005, which is where you will note some of the more brash business decisions were made. This is because upon Martin's departure, the company fell entirely into the hands of stable business genius Victor Muller. It was his idea to get into F1, a far more expensive affair than GT racing, and it was his idea, in 2010, to buy Saab! GM had bought Saab in 1989 on a whim to spite Ford, who just months earlier had default danced right into a meeting between GM and Jaguar, and offered Jaguar double what GM was. Much like any commitment made out of spite, GM infamously mishandled Saab until 2009, when the weight of the financial crisis pushed an already loss-making Saab into administration. GM, unwilling to foot the bill, put Saab up for sale. Initially, Koenigsegg were the first to come knocking to buy the ailing fellow Swede, backed by an unnamed group of Norwegian investors, the Beijing Automotive Group and the European Investment Bank. Koenigsegg quickly found that getting all these parties, GM, and the Swedish National Debt Office to communicate was like herding very rich whiny cats, and they withdrew their offer. Following this, Spiker, who at this point had made less cars in total than Saab usually made in a day, was the next most viable bidder. In 2010, after Victor had variously offered deals and then pulled out of them like a gaslighting partner, an offer was accepted, and Spiker found themselves in possession of Saab after dropping a cool $400 million that, as far as I can tell, was half Monopoly money and half hopes and dreams. The plan was to get Saab's engineers to work on the D12, which by this point had been renamed the D8, as a revolving door of potential engine suppliers were approached to make a deal as one after another they each realised that now saddled with a company thousands of times their own size, hemorrhaging money like a flesh wound to the neck, Spiker had no way of financing any potential purchases. It did not take Victor long to realise he had bitten off far more than he could chew. By 2012, after failing to sell Saab to Chinese manufacturer Youngman due to GM's refusal to provide technological support, he bit the bullet. And Swedish Automobile, the holding company set up to own Spiker and Saab, applied for bankruptcy, after accruing $2 billion in debt. Spiker attempted to sue GM in 2013 for not allowing the initial sale to Youngman, but both the initial case and the appeal were denied. Saab would eventually be bought by Nevs, which is a story unto itself. Spiker lost any confidence it had built up over the past decade in a single stroke, and immediately fell into a tailspin. The C8 had received an update in the form of the Aileron in 2009, with technical support from Lotus. By all means another stunning looking car, and apparently a much better handling one. Production was supposed to be shipped out to Coventry at some point, but this inevitably fell through. And while Spiker still advertised the car up until 2016, in reality production had ceased by 2013. This also killed off hopes of the proposed entry-level B6 Venator ever making it to market. The following year, Spiker was declared bankrupt by the courts, reportedly had zero employees, and held untold amounts in outstanding debt due to various arrangements with Saab, GM, Spiker F1, and Spiker Squadron. But it wasn't over yet. Victor still had some fight left in him. Somehow, Spiker managed to appeal its bankruptcy declaration, which is something you can apparently do, and this was GRANTED! In 2015, Victor pulled some financial gymnastics with Spiker's creditors, resumed financial operations, and merged with US electric plane startup Volta Volari, with the intent of rivaling Tesla by producing an electric supercar! Spiker then went to the 2016 Geneva Motor Show and unveiled a successor to the C8 Aileron, the C8 Preliator, powered by a new engine supplied by Koenigsegg? How? Who let Victor do this? You can't keep getting away with it! As you can probably guess, this was mostly smoke and mirrors produced by Victor in a vain attempt to attract investors, and Spiker went bankrupt again in 2021. And that was not the end of the story, because in January of 2022, Russian investors agreed to back not only a return to production, but also a return to motorsport! This definitely has absolutely nothing to do with Russian oligarchs desperately trying to shift their money out of a country with a rapidly dwindling currency value, while Victor runs his mouth about imaginary ventures yet again. 
Nothing has been heard out of Spiker since, but given that their website still hasn't been updated for almost three years, I don't think we'll be hearing anything positive out of Spiker anytime soon. And so dies one of the most unique car manufacturers of recent history, doomed by the ego of one man. Spiker's motto since the early 20th century was Nulla Tanaki Invia Est Via, mid 2000s says Laudian meaning for the tenacious, no road is impassable. Evidently, it was not tenacity that defined Victor, and therefore Spiker, but ambition, and ambition is nothing without the ability to back it up. In that department, Victor came up dry. I suppose Spiker isn't technically dead yet, so... You can bet I've got my ear to the ground on any news coming out of the Netherlands. Hello, it's me, unedited bin man again. If you don't know what the deal is here, which you would if you had watched any of my previous videos, I'm just going to talk about some stuff that I couldn't fit into the rest of the script, but should still be interesting. Firstly, I'd just like to apologize for any uh, changes in audio quality throughout the video. Uh, there were a few lines I had to re-record because my audio interface is very cheap, quite old, and not entirely happy with existing, so there were quite a few uh, pops and clicks uh, every now and again in the audio, so I had to go back and re-record those lines. I'm sorry if I missed any of those clicks, and I'm sorry if uh, the changes in audio quality from having to re-record were too intrusive. So, although I only briefly mentioned it, there was actually a plan for an entry-level spiker, the B6 Venator. There is debate as to whether it was going to be based on the Lotus Evora or the Artiga GT, but, well, it never made it to market, and I don't think it ever will, so I don't think we'll ever know. Spiker also made a concept car with Zagato, a second time that Zagato has showed up in an unscripted section, uh, which was shown at the 2007 Geneva Motor Show, I believe. Also never made it to production, because of course it didn't. Another final little tidbit is that Spiker F1, when it was sold on, became Force India, and then Force India became Racing Point, and then Racing Point became Aston Martin F1. So... In a way, there's sort of like one tiny little bit of Spiker that sort of lives on, even though they didn't create the team in the first place, but, you know. As usual, I would like to thank my friends Pine, Sai, and Harv for being present for test screenings of this video, and Harv especially for creating that uh, photoshopped poster of the magnificent men in their Spiker machines, I guess. Terrible joke. Besides that, maybe it was a little optimistic to assume that my last video would put me over a thousand subs, but hey, this one might. Still planning on making that thousand sub special, if slash when I get there. Besides that, hope to see you then. Bye bye